What I'm here to talk to you about today is a study that we undertook last year in collaboration with the SA Wine Industry Association. Essentially, we wanted to better understand what the impact of shifting small businesses in SA onto cost reflective tariffs would be. Um, Business SA is the state's chamber of commerce and we've got about 4,000 members across all sectors. And we partnered up with the SA Wine Industry Association because I guess like us, they have a lot of small businesses um, who, who would be impacted by these changes. So ideally, whilst we would have liked to go out and survey our members and, and get a quite a large sample size and what have you, um, these types of matters are quite complex. And unfortunately, when you go to survey small businesses um, around anything that revolves them pill pulling out their bill, they either they don't understand it or they just don't have the time. We're not generally talking about businesses that have compliance people or, or just people in general who can fill out these surveys. So if, you want, if, you, if you're worried about or you, you want good data, um, whilst, whilst it might not be necessarily um, statistically significant in terms of sample size, um, it, it still gives us a good understanding um, in a qualitative sense of how these types of changes, shifting businesses onto cost reflective tariffs will actually impact them and, and how they'll adapt. So we, given we're a chamber of commerce, we tried to have a mix of, of businesses in the, in, the, um, in the study. And essentially we used uh, 2XE, who are an engineering consultancy based in Adelaide, Nick Pelusis and Anna Farr there. And we were able to get funding through Energy Consumers Australia to have 2XE undertake this study. So instead of surveying, they went out, they, they I guess, rang the businesses first and, and, and got their participation and, and they made sure that they had all the billing data and what have you. So when they went to do a one-on-one -on interview, one -on -one interview, they had all that information there and they could sit down with the businesses, explain the bills, explain what cost reflective tariffs were and, um, and, and go from there. So I guess one of the first findings was that only about 50% of the businesses actually knew what demand meant in, in, the, in the sense of how demand related to the electricity network. And I, and I think there's only about 10% of the businesses who actually knew that SAPN was, was rolling out or were proposing to roll out cost reflective tariffs, which is in line with, a, as many in the room would know, a, a broader government directive to move small consumers onto cost reflective tariffs. So there's generally, I guess, a lack of understanding is, is, is what I'm trying to point out here. Um, although having said that, most of the businesses knew once the the interviewers got into it, um, what were their main demand drivers? And you know, they could recognise whether it was reverse cycle aircon, whether it was some sort of process equipment in manufacturing, high bay lighting, um, some, some other type of refrigeration type plant. They were generally pretty aware of what those drivers were. They just weren't familiar with really the concepts of um, you know, demand in so far as um, how that, that relates to the electricity network. Um, what we actually found, which is um, somewhat in line with SAPN's, I guess, um, analysis at, at a much broader scale, bearing in mind this is only 25 businesses, um, we found that the majority would actually be better off under cost reflective tariffs. Um, and interestingly, though, for the businesses themselves, before that data was analysed, most of them thought they'd be worse off and by about 10 or 20 per cent. And I think that's just because generally when businesses or any consumers sort of think that there's going to be some change in the network, they don't anticipate that that's actually going to make them better off. So the starting position is, well, this sounds like it's just going to be another cost that is going to be put onto, um, onto small business. Um, that said, most of the ones, the businesses that would be better off, the, the amounts were probably less than $1,000 per annum. And, they weren't necessarily an incentive enough for businesses to sort of think, well, I'll go out and invest in a smart meter and, and, um, and, and you know, transition onto a cost effective tariff. Um, I guess, as I said before, there, there is a reluctance to sort of believe that um, you'll be better off and without understanding your load profile, which a lot of businesses didn't, um, even those with, with smart meters, um, there is that reluctance to actually want to shift onto a cost reflective tariff despite knowing that um, for the most part you are likely to actually be better off. Part of the, the study we looked at I guess the lay of the land in terms of the, the metering arrangements for the businesses that, we, that were surveyed um, and we found that um, there were a number that did have interval meters um, and, and some 
uh, type five and mostly type six. Um, the businesses that had the, the smart meters or the interval meters generally weren't aware that they had them or they weren't aware of their capability. Um, and of the businesses with the type six meters, they generally said, look, if we, if we need to move or we, if we have to move on to smart meters um, or cost reflective tariffs, that it should be something that is either free or, or subsidized now. We didn't go into them uh, any detail about what that's cost in other states. We're just sort of trying to relay here what the expectation of the businesses are. The key recommendations from the study um, I, I've summarised here, um, and essentially what it came down to was a bit of a go slow. Um, we, there's a lot of, I guess, um, a lack of understanding from the businesses as to what exactly the changes will mean for them, even though um, you know, a lot of them would be better off. I guess in general, a lot of them said that um, their peak demand periods were sort of fairly set and you know, usually between sort of 12 and, and, and four to six, and it was very difficult to, um, you know, to shift, whether it's the customers, you can't really off-peak the customers as such, or their employees are used to working certain hours. Um, so that they did find it very hard, and, and particularly in seasonal industries where for example, the wine sector, their vintage comes at a certain time and, and they just have to you know, be fermenting and what have you during that time. Um, some wineries had, had looked at trying to shift their loads around um, but found that the, the penalty rates associated with that move in terms of starting earlier than the day actually didn't offset the savings on the electricity cost. So look, that, that does vary you know, depending on award structures and what have you. Um, a lot of the businesses, I guess, we, we would have interviewed would have had a, a number or would have been generally on or paying on some type of award. So all these things have to be borne in mind in terms of how easy it is to actually shift a load around. In terms of the um, mandatory in, uh, or the 25 amp um, threshold or the mandatory move if for 25 amp or greater installation, we, we were reluctant to support that because essentially given the state of our state's economy, we didn't want to be um, necessarily disincentivizing small businesses from investing in capital upgrades. And we, we didn't believe that that particular trigger was demonstrably linked to a, a demand type um, factor. There was at that stage a consumption threat, threshold cutoff for, for the um, proposed move to cost effective tariffs that was 40 megawatt hours per annum. Um, we didn't see that there was any significant difference between the businesses uh, below and above that threshold in our study. Um, so we were requesting further explanation there. There were also some tariff options um, given to businesses um, at that time in terms of a transition type option and um, you know, a, a, a full year um, peak and, and summer and winter peaks and, and what have you. I guess from our perspective with any of this, we have to remember that businesses um, don't necessarily have a lot of understanding to start with. So the more options that are introduced, the harder it is for them to really understand, I guess, what the whole move is about. So we would prefer that as we go forward that we, we keep things as simple as possible. And that's why we recommended um, you know, a lot of communication around if there are any tariff options or transition options in terms of you know, when they're coming to an end or what have you. Um, in terms of contestable metering, we, at, at the time, the changes were supposed to come in before contestable metering in South Australia. We recommended that be moved so that there was competition um, for the providers of the smart metering. Um, and in general, better information and support there for small businesses, um, you know, whether it's developing sort of some sort of information type packs or or tariff type calculators, they really need to understand that um, you know, if they're moved or if they have an option to move onto a cost reflective tariff, what that means. Because for most of them, they said, look, you know, if we have to invest in some sort of plant equipment upgrade or what have you to, to offset or to mitigate against rising costs, it'll take us you know, between 12 months and two years to sort of make that, um, make that decision and, and, and change a process or to essentially build a an investment case. Um, so we, we need to bear in mind that they need time and, and that's, that's why we've, we've sort of, I guess, recommended um, much more of a go slow. 
A lot of water's moved under the bridge since this particular study. This was conducted in early 2016, so you know, before the, the blackout and, um, and whilst the wholesale market had started to move in SA, it probably hadn't impacted small businesses as much. Um, they only, I guess, had their first ra range of increases in July 2016. Um, and SAPN, to their credit, have adopted a much less aggressive approach to this transition. Um, and you know, the reasons they've outlined are you know, that the peak demand forecasts aren't, aren't as high as, as they were. And, and so they don't see that there's necessarily the, the need to move as fast as they might have otherwise thought that there was a need to move. Um, so we have, we're still awaiting the AER's final decision on um, the 27th of February. Um, so it's not far away. Um, we're, we're hoping that that will be sort of in line with the draft and, and where SAPN have now landed. I guess also what's become a lot more prevalent and, and these costs will start to get passed down to small businesses is the rise in the um, generation costs in the market, which have become you know, the, the biggest single issue facing a lot of our members, particularly in that large customer market who are not necessarily big businesses, but you know, they're in that different level of the market. They're consuming greater at 160 megawatts hours per annum. They're essentially going to brokers. They're, you know, that their marketplace is, is a lot different and they've seen essentially a doubling of their wholesale energy costs in the last sort of 12, 18 months, depending on when they've gone to the market. So implementing this type of change um, onto small business at a time when, when their costs are also rising, it's a little bit slower because as many of you will appreciate, those costs don't get factored in necessarily straight away. It's usually on sort of more of an annual cycle. We don't, we don't believe it's, um, it's the right time to be pushing too hard. We also um, have less understanding of the capital and, and ongoing operating costs of smart meters and bearing in mind that we will be moving to a contestable market. So some of this will, I guess, be determined by the market. But in terms of variable costs of the smart meters, um, I've tried to get some information about this and it's very hard. I think Victoria is mainly bundled costs and, and elsewhere it's very difficult to sort of get an understanding of what ongoing variable costs will be and you know, bearing in mind that there will be a nature of economies of scale that play out in all of this. And, but as consumers, we would want to, or we would expect that as, as we get to a broad penetration in the network that these smart meters and cost reflective tariffs are actually helping the network operators with their network, manage it more efficiently and that those efficiencies are to the extent that they would normally be passed back to the consumers through the, um, through the network um, operating um, rules. I guess even more recently though, from a consumer perspective, we've got to start to ask of these types of processes that are driving small businesses and other consumers onto cost reflective tariffs, what are the, um, what are the drivers? Are we incentivizing reduced demand because of the network constraints or is it because of the supply side constraints? And we've had a few load shedding events in SA in the last 15 months. And AMO came out last week, as many of you might be aware, and essentially we're asking consumers to conserve demand to um, avoid load shedding, particularly in New South Wales. So that, that type of price signal, and whilst those peaks may have been coincident with the network, with a likely network peak, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that that will always be the case. So we have to ask, in terms of the price signal to reduce demand, is it about at times of, of low supply or at times of high demand on the grid? Because they, they may not necessarily always align. So that's another new development um, that we've been aware of. Thank you very much. <laughs>